Okay, now that we've learned about VLIW, let's move on to the next big idea, systolic arrays. Uh, this is an idea that was actually developed around the same time, and it has had a lot of impact similar to VLIW. And uh, as you will see, it's ac it actually forms the core of many machine learning accelerators today uh, due to its specialized nature to do matrix multiplication, and in particular convolutions, uh, which is at the core of many convolutional neural networks today. And uh, I like this idea a lot, actually. I used to teach it um, much earlier than it became popular uh, with the machine learning accelerators, because fundamentally, it's a, it's, it's a good idea to design an accelerator. Uh, and I think uh, it's always good to think about these good ideas, because they may, they may find their matching applications uh, at some point into the future, uh, especially when they provide some fundamental benefits like uh, what we will see today. Okay. Before I jump into systolic arrays, I will just, uh, since uh, some registrations are going on right now, if you're interested in learning more about computer architecture, we offer a seminar in computer architecture every semester, actually, not just fall. Uh, like right now, the seminar is happening, for example. You can take a look at uh, the seminar uh, course uh, with the, at this link over here. And it's essentially a rigorous seminar on fundamental and cutting edge topics in computer architecture. Uh, you get to learn how to do critical presentations, reviews, and discussions of seminal works in computer architecture. Some of them are cutting edge, some of them are seminal. And it's going to be interesting if you take it. A lot of students actually like it, I think. It's a bit work, but uh, you get a lot of benefits, uh, in my opinion, from the work uh, that you do. And we cover many issues and ideas and perform, especially the important part for me is critical thinking and discussion. So you can register for the course online if you're interested. And some of the uh, course, uh, current courses are also live streamed uh, or uploaded. So you can take a look at uh, the format if you're interested. And if you're in general interested in learning more and doing research in computer architecture, I have three suggestions. Feel free to email me with your interest, CC Juan and any other TA uh, you may uh, work with. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to talk. I would suggest taking the seminar course and the computer architecture course, which is the more advanced course. And if you're doing the readings and uh, extra assignments on your own, especially the readings that I specified, none of the readings are required, as you know, but some of the readings are even less required than others, as you probably have guessed. Uh, but uh, those, are, those probably show your interest in computer architecture. So feel free to contact us because this is a really a great time in computer architecture. Some people call it the golden age of computer architecture because everything is bottlenecked by computer architecture today, as we will see in this lecture also. And there are many exciting projects and research topics uh, on a lot of these topics that I list over here. I'm not going to talk more about this, but there's a limited list on our group's website. And this is a limited list because it doesn't cover everything because there's just not enough time to write up about everything we are working on. Uh, so you can contact us. OK, so with that announcement, uh, let's continue with the other execution paradigms to get higher level concurrency in our systems and systolic arrays is going to be the next one. And hopefully we will have uh, time to cover uh, uh, in a short way, decoupled access and execute because it's a small, a relatively small idea to cover. It's an important idea though. So these are some readings that I would recommend you to do. I'm going to cover uh, why systolic architectures paper by HT Kung, which is a beautiful seminal paper. And uh, we're going to cover, uh, there's a more recent systolic array paper that talks about Google's tensor processing unit which is at the core of systolic array architecture. If you remember from lecture one, I mentioned this to you and I mentioned that you're going to learn about it uh, in lecture 19 or so. And today is lecture 19. So we're going to talk about Google's TPU as well, which is based on uh, the systolic array principles. And next week, we're going to talk about GPUs. Uh, and this is a rec uh, these are both recommended readings overall and an earlier version of the impact of single instruction, multiple data architectures in uh, Instruction set in the x86 instruction set architecture, the multimedia extensions. So it's going to be fun. We're going to talk about both single instruction, multiple data, and GPUs. But let's jump into systolic arrays. So basically, what was the motivation for designing what's called a systolic array? Essentially, uh, uh, people wanted to design an accelerator that has a simple, regular design, similar to what we have discussed earlier, VLIW, right? We want the hardware to be simple, regular, and we want to replicate it. So we want to keep the unique parts small, number of unique parts, small and regular. We want high concurrency, clearly. We want high performance. And especially at that time, these were these accelerators were being thought of for uh, tasks like linear algebra, uh, vision, image processing, similarly to the neural networks of today, right? So basically, we wanted high, conc high, high concurrency at the time. 
And most importantly, uh, in, in the design of an accelerator, uh, you need it to balance the computation and IO and memory bandwidth. This will become more clear uh, in a little bit. Basically, you want to maximize the number of operations you do on an, uh, on an element that you fetch from memory. Because memory fetch is expensive. You don't want to go back to memory many, many times uh, like a CPU does. Basically, whenever you fetch a single uh, data element, you want to transform it inside the machine between processing elements so that you don't need to fetch it and write it back to memory, fetch it, write it back to memory, fetch it, write it back to memory many, many times. That's the idea over here. And the idea is to uh, basically to achieve all of uh, these three goals. The idea is to replace a single processing element with a regular array vector or array of processing elements and carefully orchestrate the flow of data to this array and within between the processing elements in the array. So we will see what this means more clearly, such that these processing elements collectively transform a piece of input data before outputting it to memory. You want to maximize the operations you do on the data before you have to write it back. And this maximizes the computation done on a single piece of data element brought from memory. And that's the, that's the one big benefit of a systolic array architecture. So basically, the uh, picture looks like this at a high level. This is from the paper that I recommended for, uh, to you. Essentially, instead of having a single processing element that basically keeps fetching data and writing it back to memory, you basically have, in this particular case, a string of processing elements or vector of processing elements that are connected to each other in a linear fashion, as you can see. There are six elements over here. And basically, you fetch the data. One processing element does something to it, passes it on to the another processing element. This processing element does something to it, pass it on to the, another, uh, the next processing element, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that the benefit over here is 30 million operations at that time, as opposed to 5 million operations, because you're basically using the data item six times, let's say, as opposed to going to memory six times uh, for the same data item or transformed version of the data item. So that's the basic principle, to maximize the usage of a data item. And this is one example of a systolic array. You're basically... Uh, have six processing elements. But as we will see, six solid arrays can be two-dimensional uh, as well, or ir not so regular as well. Different, they may have different diagonals as well. We will see some examples of this. Uh, so linear is, of course, the simplest example. right? And the connections can be multi-dimensional and not as regular as we see over here. Basically, this processing element may be back connected to this processing element also. So we will, we will also see the differences from pipelining soon. So basically, this is inspired by actually human architecture, let's say. Uh, essentially, memory can be thought of as the heart. It's pumping blood to the cells that are processing elements. So data is blood, and processing elements are cells. And memory pulses data through the processing elements. So if you think about our heart, we have a vein system where data or blood flows through the cells, right? And the cells really operate on that blood to do whatever they need to do, right? Cells are not individually connected uh, to memory one by one, and we don't have a single cell. Uh, otherwise, that would not be scalable. So the scalability really comes from pulsing of the data to, through the veins into the cells, such that the cells transform the data, and eventually the uh, data flows back to memory or the heart, and then it gets recirculated again. Right. So that's a nice analogy, and I think this is an analogy that has been successful, uh, and it makes sense. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the analogy, you can read this paper. So basically, uh, the, uh, the other way of uh, phrasing this idea is data flows to, from the computer memory in a rhythmic fashion, passing through many processing elements before it returns to memory. So you need to orchestrate the data, and we will see what this means. So similar to blood flow, heart pumps uh, data uh, into many cells, and many cells return the data to the heart, and this keeps going on and on, essentially. Uh, and different cells process the blood. Many veins operate simultaneously, and this can be many dimensional also. Okay, so why? Because special purpose and accelerators and architectures need what we discussed earlier, simple and regular design, high concurrency, and very importantly, balanced computation and IO or memory band. So as we discussed, the basic principle is to replace a single processing element with a regular array of processing elements and carefully orchestrate the flow of data between the processing elements as well as from the memory into the processing elements and processing elements out to the memory to balance computation and memory band. So you may say, OK, this looks like a pipeline, right? But it's not like a pipeline. There is some similarity, but there are significant differences also. Basically, first of all, these are individual processing elements. In fact, each processing element can potentially be pipelined. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but you may see 
so in, these are individual processing elements. It could be a processor also, as we will see later, but initially these are specialized functional units. Uh, but you're really not fetching uh, um, uh, instructions. Uh, basically, you're not dividing the instruction processing cycle between them. You're really, these are individual processing elements that may be doing exactly the same thing to the data, for example. It's just data, data is flowing through them, OK? Uh, array structure can also be nonlinear and multidimensional. And clearly, our pipelines were never nonlinear and multidimensional. I mean, uh, we, of course, made the pipelines more complicated, but it was also always a linear flow. And processing uh, element connections can be multidirectional and different speeds because they can communicate with each other. Because they, it basically all stems from the fact that these are individual processing elements and they can communicate with each other, as opposed to a pipeline that's designed carefully to really uh, break the instruction processing into multiple cycles. Processing elements can have local memory and execute kernels, basically, uh, rather than a piece of the instruction. And we will see that. Initially, when they were proposed, it was not like that. But over time, actually, processing elements became more sophisticated to run more general purpose code. And it can have local memories inside each of these processing elements. So it's fascinating, basically, what you can build out of this. And it's a lead to concepts like pipeline uh, parallel programming, which is also different from pipelining, even though the pipeline is in the name, uh, and a lot of interesting concepts, as we will see uh, soon. OK, let me give you a systolic computation example. And I will take a detour into convolutional neural networks, because it's really important at this point to discuss why systolic computation has been so successful, why systolic arrays have been so successful for neural networks as well. Because I'm not giving this lecture in 2010 right now, when I first started giving this lecture. At that time, none of these convolutional neural network accelerators existed. Right now, we have them. so. I will, uh, I will motivate it with the convolutional neural network accelerators. But convolution was one of the major reasons why uh, systolic arrays were built. And you can find this in the HT Kong paper. And convolution is a very basic mathematical operation or statistical operation where you filter uh, an input element uh, using essentially some weights, let's say. And you will see the operation soon. Basically, it's used in adaptive filtering, pattern matching, correlation uh, finding, polynomial evaluation, et cetera. Uh, many image processing tasks, many vision processing tasks, and lately, many machine learning tasks. We can have up to hundreds of convolutional layers in convolutional neural networks, as we will see, as we will discuss. So basically, what is the convolution operation? It's mathematically defined this way. Given the sequence of weights, uh, weights, weight one through a weight k, and the input sequence y1 through that, basically, you can read it on your own. Convolution uh, is the result sequence, uh, y, uh, oh, sorry, input sequence x1 through xn. Convolution is the result sequence y1 through that uh, defined by this computation, w1 xi plus w2 xi plus 1 dot dot dot, as you can see over here. So it's a mathematical definition. You're basically applying a filter of weights to an input sequence. I'm going to demonstrate this pictorially more uh, in a little bit. But basically, existing convolutional neural networks do many of these convolutions on an input image. So convolutional neural networks have uh, been developed for image recognition. For example, in this particular case, handwritten digit recognition. It's a uh, Lenet is a convolutional neural network that's specifically designed for handwritten digit recognition. You can see it takes an input image. Uh, and it basically uh, uses some filtering, convolution-based filtering. This is one layer of the network to generate some feature maps on different parts of the image. And then it subsamples the image, does something else. And then it does some more convolution on top of it. And then some more sampling. And then basically it has some other layers uh, to actually basically make sense of what this image consists of and what uh, digit uh, it maps to, basically. Uh, the, the, uh, my purpose here is not to give you an introduction to neural networks. You should really take a machine learning course uh, to really understand uh, those topics. But essentially, the key takeaway is convolutions are used uh, in uh, these net, uh, networks uh, a lot, right? OK, I see some questions, but uh, I cannot see all of them for some reason. My chat is not working anymore uh, very well. Uh, OK, yeah, there's nothing I can answer at this point. I can see at least. Uh, OK, uh, but basically, uh, I, think, uh, I think the question is about perceptrons versus convolution. So uh, convolution is a mathematical operation. Perceptron is a single layer network, I should say. It's not a neural network, but it's, it's basically the representation of a neuron. Neural networks are multi-layers. There's, there's also a multi-layer perceptron. But modern neural networks are, let's say, based loosely on the idea of the perceptron. Perceptron also does uh, some weighting on inputs, right? So basically, there's some similarity, as you mentioned, over here. No question about that. 
uh, but existing neural networks do much more than a perceptron because you need to transform the input using multiple layers. And also the training of the perceptron was very, very simple as we briefly discussed last time. The training of existing neural networks is done in a much, much more sophisticated way through something called back propagation, which is really out of the scope of this course. But basically what I'm showing over here is how you use a trained network to do inference. So in any network, you need to train it with a, sam uh, with a, a sample uh, a set of images, for example, uh, to really construct these weights and these different layers. And then whenever you're given an input, you need to do an inference so that you can infer what the input uh, should be classified as. So if you're looking at inference over here, you're given an input and actually you're trying to figure out whether the input is A, B, C, D, E, F, G or something like that. Uh, so you need to have a trained network for that purpose. And for both actually, for both inference and training, you need convolutions, but you use them in a different way uh, in inference and training. So as we discussed in perceptron, you need to train the perceptron and then you need to do inference uh, on it or prediction on it. Uh, a multi-layer uh, deep neural network, you still need to do the same thing, except you need to do many, many more operations for both training as well as inference. Okay, so the purpose of this picture is to show that you need to do convolutions to actually understand different parts of an image, to filter them out, to figure out what's going on internally. So it's a lot of statistical processing in the end, as you can see uh, over here. And I'm not going to go into the details because there are many networks with many different details. But at the basic level, the convolution looks like this, basically. This is one convolutional layer of a neural network. So if you go back to this, you basically are looking at this layer over here. And one convolutional layer, you take essentially some input. It could be part of an image. The blue part is an input over here. You have a filter. Uh, input is five by five, as you can see over here. Filter is three by three, that's gray. Uh, filter is going through, basically going over the input, as you can see. Output is 555 green. And in one layer of the neural network, you have the input image or whatever input is coming from the previous layer. Uh, and you basically apply the, com uh, apply the filter uh, or the kernel, let's say, on top of this input, such that you do convolution operations so that you produce the output. And convolution operations were defined earlier as we discussed, right? That's the operation. And of course, you may need to do padding, for example, because your input and output may not match exactly, or input and kernel may not match exactly. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, clearly, uh, hopefully, this picture shows you that the, uh, you're basically going uh, filtering, uh, applying the filter to all different parts of the input so that you can get an output feature map. OK, then later you can subsample the output feature, feature map, for example. So that's another example uh, that shows basically convolution computation. I haven't verified the correctness of this convolution computation, but uh, assuming that uh, the convolution computation is true, this is what you get basically. Okay, so if you're interested in convolutional neural networks, uh, Jan LeCun, who is one of the uh, big names uh, who have uh, essentially been part of the machine learning revolution more recently, uh, has a web page that talks about Linet uh, and talks about how it uh, processes input images uh, and essentially recognizes what digits are passing through. And you can see how the different layers also operate. What are the outputs of different layers in internally inside the network, et cetera. Uh, but basically, I'm not going to go into more detail. You can learn a lot more about uh, this topic uh, clearly. So convolutional layers can be implemented using matrix multiplication as well. Uh, in fact, matrix multiplication, uh, that's what uh, you, you, you may do to map a convolution operation into a GPU, for example, or a CPU, or a systolic array. Uh, again, this picture over here shows how you would uh, take the convolution and implement as a matrix multiplication. So these are the input features. These are the convolutional filters. And these are the output features. Essentially, you could consider this a convolutional layer. Basically, you construct a convolutional filter uh, matrix. And you also construct an input feature matrix. And you basically do matrix multiplication. So this is not fully correct. We're going to put a correct version of it online. But don't worry about the numbers. But the takeaway is that you're changing the convolution computation to matrix multiplication over here so that you can map it to your hardware better, especially GPUs. Uh, and the key is basically converting the convolutional filters into a matrix and converting the input features into a matrix and multiplying them through matrix multiplication such that the result is a convolution operation as specified by the convolution. OK, and uh, this has been very powerful. In fact, uh, here I would also uh, maybe pitch in the importance of applied courses like the course you're taking and maybe other courses you may take. Essentially, applied courses are very powerful because students can actually do work uh, and do research that can revolutionize computing. And that's essentially what happened 
uh, at the University of Toronto in the early 2010s. Basically, uh, uh, GPUs were important at the time. At the, the, uh, GPUs were becoming very important. And there were professors who were actually teaching uh, uh, courses on how to program GPUs, essentially. And some of machine learning students, PhD students, these are, uh, who are Jeff Hinton students. Jeff Hinton is actually one of the uh, pioneers in machine learning also, who developed uh, some of the earliest backpropagation algorithms, for example, uh, which got uh, not a whole lot of attention initially. But after his students actually took this course and they implemented uh, a deep neural network on a GPU, and they were able to train it with uh, more than a million images, and they were able to win the ImageNet competition in terms of how well they can recognize the images, uh, that backpropagation algorithm and the convolutional neural networks took off because now with the power of a powerful GPU hardware, they were actually able to do the computations that were required to train these networks. So initially when backpropagation was developed in the 1980s, it was too difficult to, do, uh, to perform. Well, there were two major problems. First of all, there were not a lot of data. Second, uh, it was too difficult to perform all of those computations easily uh, in processors, but GPUs made it a lot easier actually to train a neural network with many images. And this is an example of computer architecture really enabling uh, the, I don't know how to call it, maybe the second machine learning revolution, uh, such that actually machine learning it, now it has become much more powerful. Basically, these are the students who were able to show uh, through a, an applied course that they could do image net classification. And you can read this paper. This is actually the paper that has uh, enabled a lot of machine learning to take off recently. They were able, able to show that uh, compared to uh, the state of the arts at the time, they were able to get 10% get higher accuracy in classification tasks by using this deep neural network and actually have a very efficient, by having a very efficient GP implementation of the convolution operation. You can see in the abstract of the paper, they say to make training faster, we use non-saturating neurons and a very efficient GP implementation of the convolution app operation. Now you can see the error rates. And you can see that the neural network is big actually, for, and even current bigger neural networks are much bigger. Uh, they basically say it has 60 million parameters and 650,000 neurons, okay? And you can read the paper if you're interested in this. And this is a seminal paper and a recent paper that has enabled machine learning. Later on, basically, machine learning essentially took off. This is uh, basically uh, Google uh, pr introduced the Google net where they showed that they could get even higher accuracy by adding more network layers and other optimizations. Basically in AlexNet in the previous version over here, uh, uh, there were eight layers and Google increased it to 22. And later uh, ResNet actually uh, in 2015 or 2016, uh, was able to reach better than human accuracy. As you can see, the human ac accuracy is supposed to be about 5% according to experiments. And they were able to get, oh, this is the error rate, let's say human error rate and the image tasks uh, that are input. And the ResNet accuracy was about 3.6%, as you can see. But first, CNN made a big difference, basically. The previously, image net, ta net tasks were done using some other algorithms, not machine learning algorithms. But you can see that the first CNN trained on a GPU enabled a huge increase in accuracy or reduction in uh, uh, misprediction rate. And later, all of the winners of the image classification task were CNNs. And the latest winner uh, at the time uh, was a 152 layer network. Today, we have networks that are even deeper. Okay, so this is some motivation. And if you're interested, you can certainly learn more about neural networks, but you can see that convolutions are a big part of it. There are other layers, but convolutions are actually extremely expensive in terms of computation. Okay, so now we know about competition, uh, convolutions and we know about why they're important, especially today. Uh, I think they were important earlier also, but today, uh, clearly, machine learning is a huge application that's being used by essentially everyone, uh, inference and training. Uh, so they're even more important today. Now let's take a look at how, how a systolic array at a very basic level accelerates this convolution operation. And this is basically it. This is the example that I'm going to show you. This is the example that was designed. That was one of the designs uh, that was introduced in H.T. Kung's paper. And you can see their processing elements organized in a linear fashion. And you can see that the input data, Xs, flow from left to right. And you, have, you can see there are three processing elements over here. And here we are computing y1 equals w1x1, w2x plus, w2x2 plus, w3x3. So each processing element 
has a weight inside it that's stationary, that stays there in a register, for example. And the processing element behaves this way. There are two inputs, x in and y in. y in is going to be the output later on. But basically, what the processing element does is, uh, there's also x out. Uh, they, there are two outputs, x out and y out. You can see that x is flow from left to right, y is flow from right to, uh, flow from right to left. Weights is static. Uh, assume that that's the case. So basically, what, the, uh, what this uh, processing element does is basically it sets x out to x in at the end of the cycle. At the end of the cycle, it sets y out to y in plus w times x in. So what is this? This is a multiply and accumulate, which is the basis of matrix multiplication and basis of the convolution operation as well. You need to do multiply, accumulate, multiply, accumulate, right? Basically, you set y out to y in plus w, which is static, uh, times x in. OK, so you operate on the two inputs times the weight, uh, plus the weight, and y out goes. So how does it happen? Basically, you need to orchestrate the data flow nicely. You can see that x1 is sent first. There's a bubble. And then x2 is sent. And then there's a bubble. And then x3 is sent. So basically, every other cycle, you send an, an input x element into this systolic array. And once x1 arrives here, you should also have y1 arrive here. OK, once x2 arrives here, you should also have y2 arrive here. OK, uh, basically, you need to make sure that you get uh, the right, uh, the data flowing from the left and the output that you're going to accumulate into that's flowing from the right come actually at the right times. That's, why, that's what I mean by orchestrating the data flow. But if you look at this example, uh, the results you will get when x1 arrives here and y1 arrives here will be here. Uh, here, we don't get the. Uh, X out because we're not going to do anything with X anymore. So basically, uh, the result over here, uh, this output will be W1, X1, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. So Y1 is equal to W1, X1, uh, OK? Basically, you accumulate things onto the Y1. Initially, Y1 is 0. You should, you should also assume that, basically. Initially, Y1 is provided as 0. But once Y1 uh, goes here, uh, X2 also arrives here. Basically, y1 also accumulates w to x2. And once y1 goes here, x3 also comes here. And then y1 accumulates w plus w3 plus x3. So basically, at the end, when y1 gets output over here, you get w1 x1, w2 x plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 by just flowing the data through these plusing elements that have different weights, w1, w2, w3. And you can convince yourself you could do this for y2 by orchestrating the data in a different way, and y3 as well. But I'm not going to do that at this point. Uh, but I'm going to show you a later matrix multiplication example that's going to be maybe even more intuitive uh, to some of you, since you may have studied matrix multiplication. But that's basically it. We have a processing element, very simple. And we connect the processing elements such that we can flow the data nicely into them to accomplish convolution. There's nothing uh, fancier than that. And it's very specialized, as you can see. The processing element is just doing multiply and accumulate and pass uh, the x in uh, value uh, to, uh, to, to the outside, OK? Uh, OK. OK, so it, you can actually improve that. If you read the paper, and I would recommend reading the paper, you can actually improve this design in many ways. There are many other designs as well. Uh, uh, you can see that. Uh, so I think there's one question. This way, x is always the same. No? Yes, x is always the same, because x uh, is, not, is, an, is not an output, right? x is the inputs. So basically, you can think of filter is inside the processing elements. Different filter weights are inside the processing elements. X is the input. Y is the output. So X remains the same. And X should be remain the same. Uh, OK, are the weights distributed to the processing elements according to the necessary computation? Absolutely, yes. Well, you need to distribute the weights to the processing elements uh, according to what computation you're trying to achieve. And we will see that that's going to be important. How are the weights determined and assigned? Well, that depends on the, what you need to do. So weights are determined. For example, if you're doing inference over here, uh, weights, need to, uh, weights are determined by the training algorithm. This may be your convolutional layer, for example. And in that layer, you know what weights to use because you've already trained your machine learning model. Right? So these are all good questions, but they're more essentially, uh, the second one is essentially, uh, you need to determine the weights to use, of course. And that is part of your uh, function that you need to accomplish. OK, so if you look at the paper, what you can do is, uh, you can implement the adder and multiplier separately also and orchestrate the flow of data into those separately such that you can overlap the addition and multiplication executions. Uh, 
here, uh, we don't have that over here. So there are some disadvantages to this that I'm not going to cover. I would recommend that you take a look at the uh, nicely written paper. Uh, but uh, you can actually improve the performance, improve the throughput of this sort of uh, convolutional uh, arrays, let's say, or systolic arrays, essentially, uh, by doing different tricks like partitioning the operations and uh, partitioning the data flow uh, accordingly. OK, so basically, uh, I think what I'm getting at, again, is one needs to carefully orchestrate when data elements are input to the array. And one needs to, of course, put the weights uh, carefully as well, and when the output is buffered as well. So this gets more involved when array dimensionality increases and processing elements are less predictable in terms of latency. Initially, when convolutional neural networks were designed, they were not, uh, predi uh, they, they actually had fixed latency. But if you, for example, start adding memory accesses inside the processing elements, then you run into some issues. Uh, usually people don't do that, but there might be some application scenarios where you may actually need to do it. But let me give you an example very quickly. This is actually going to be part of your homework, so I'm not going to solve the entire thing. But this is an example 2D systolic array computation. We're going to multiply two 3 by 3 matrices, as you can see, and keep the final result in processing element accumulators. So in this case, uh, processing elements will uh, host the result. We're going to accumulate the data inside the processing elements. And this is the basic processing element that I'm going to give you. Actually, in your homework, you're going to reverse engineer this and try to figure out how to do it. Uh, but basically, uh, let's say this is the processing element. R is the accumulator. Inputs are N and M. Outputs are Q and P. And it's two-dimensional, as you can see, because we're going to communicate with uh, uh, all of our neighbors, as you can see. Basically, what this processing element does, it basically passes input M to the right, to P. It passes input N to the uh, lower part. Q is equal to N. It does a multiply and accumulate on this, its accumulator. Basically, R becomes R plus M times N. Okay, And we're going to use that to actually do a matrix multiplication. And again, as I said, I'm not going to go through this, but essentially, if you want to do a 3 by 3 matrix multiplication, you need to have 3 by 3 elements replicated. Each of them do exactly the same thing. And we basically feed the data elements uh, of the different input matrices A and B this way. So A goes from uh, left to right. And different rows of A go from left to right. So the first row of A goes from here. First row of, second row of A goes from here. Third row of A goes from here. First row of B goes from here. Second row of B goes from here. Third row of B goes from here. And you basically see that A00 and B00 come right away. But B01 and A01, A10 A1, are delayed uh, by uh, one cycle. So I, sh I shouldn't say first row. This is really the column. This is the first column of B. And this is the second column of B. And this is the third column of B, OK? Uh, I said rows, but they should really be columns because you multiply their row by column, right? Essentially, that's what we're doing. But basically, you need to orchestrate the data so that you need to do the first computations first. And you need to ensure that the output of that computation, output of this processing elements, arrives here before you input some input element over here. So this is a very simple example of matrix multiplication, actually. It's relatively easy to do. And if you think about it, it makes sense because you need to delay the input, the third row of input, by two cycles over here. So you input 0, 0 because you should not do any calculation because the data item that you input from here did not arrive here yet. Right? So basically, you need to figure out how long you need to delay the inputs into each element. So this element is the poor element, if you will. It needs to get the inputs from B and A after four cycles, if you will, because two cycle delay plus two cycle inside the uh, uh, array. OK, you can think about this more. And it's very simple. And I think uh, once you do the homework, you'll have fun with it. But this is a very simple example of two-dimensional systolic array computation, actually. OK, so this is, the, uh, this is from your uh, reading. But you can see systolic arrays can be like this, depending on what you compute. Systolic arrays can be like this. Uh, basically, there are different trade-offs which we're not getting, uh, going to get into. Uh, you can see uh, one-dimensional systolic array can be used, or two-dimensional can be used. But I'm not going to go into the, the uh, trade-offs. Uh, uh, you can read the uh, paper for it. OK, and you can see that the choice of a one or two dimensional scheme is very dependent on how cells and memories will be implemented, because it's all about overlapping and, and not overlapping of the latencies, for example. Uh, by the way, if I go back to here, uh, this is the matrix multiplication, right? Here, we basically stored the matrix inside the processing elements. We didn't have to do that. There is another way of doing matrix multiplication where the result flows out. But I'm, I don't show it over here, and maybe you can start thinking about it. Here, the result doesn't flow out. Results get accumulated inside uh, the processing element. And eventually, uh, 
you get C00 over here, C01 over here, C02 over here. And later you need to result out, uh, read the result out sometime uh, so in some way. But you can also implement a two-dimensional systolic array that outputs the result in, 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 as opposed to accumulating it inside an accumulator inside the processing element. Okay, think about that. Okay, there could be combinations also. In fact, this uh, beautiful paper goes into a lot of interesting combinations. You can chain together systolic arrays to more form more, even more powerful specialized systems. This particular uh, systolic array, for example, is capable of produ producing on the fly least squares fit uh, to all the data that has arrived up to any given moment. So it's basically, uh, what, it, what it's doing is, it's really doing stream processing on real-time data. It's basically trying to find a least squares function that fits this data. It's a very statistical processing. It's doing some analysis on a series of data, basically. And you can see that data needs to be orchestrated nicely. Outputs need to be orchestrated. And you can see that it consists of two components. And I'm not going to go into them. You can read the paper. There's a systolic array that does orthogonal triangularization and another uh, systolic array that essentially solves that triangular really linear system and outputs a result. And you can take a look. It's fun, actually, to connect these. And you can see how specialized these systolic arrays can potentially get. But specialization enables you efficiency as well. So that brings me to my next point, basically. The big advantage, well, there are two reasons why systolic arrays are uh, very highly advantaged, because they're, they're based on some principle, and they're also specialized. Basically, the principle is that it efficiently makes use of limited memory bandwidth. It doesn't need to go to memory for every single data item. It makes maximum use of one single data item by balancing computation to IO bandwidth availability. And it's also specialized because it's, uh, it's, it basically fits the computation uh, to uh, uh, basically it, it, it has a particular computation in mind that it can do very, very efficiently. Right? It's implemented to do that computation. But computation needs to fit the processing element organization and functions and the array organization as well. And if, it, if that is the case, then you get highly improved efficiencies, simple design, high concurrency, and high performance all at the same time. It's a very nice accelerator for that purpose. So basically, you can also do good. Uh, it's, it's always good to do more with less memory bandwidth requirement in such an accelerator. So these two things combined together makes a very powerful accelerator, especially when you have a lot of data to deal with. You, you have a lot of data flowing into the systolic array and out of the systolic array, but systolic array itself doesn't need to go to the memory for every single data item, right? Because it's really... Uh, maximizes the uh, operations that it does to every single data item. But the downside comes from the specialization, unfortunately, because essentially it's not generally applicable, right? Because computation needs to fit what we have seen, the processing element functions, as well as the array organization. And so you cannot apply everything to it clearly, right? And you cannot, it's not general purpose, as you can see. You cannot just run any program on it, as it's obvious, hopefully. So specialization is a big upside as well as a downside. OK, so people later tried to improve programmability in systolic arrays. Uh, basically, each programming element in systolic array uh, was changed to store multiple weights. Weights could be selected on the fly, for example. This could answer some of your questions, for example. How do you decide which weight to use? Uh, so if you want to do adaptive filtering, for example, you may want to decide one weight uh, set or another weight set. So basically, people added more programmability inside the systolic array. Uh, and to ease the implementation of different operations and general, may, maybe make this systolic array more general. And taken further, this idea leads to maybe each processing element can have its own data and instruction memory as well so that they can store intermediate results, partial results, constants, for example. That would be very useful. And instruction memory so that you can do some general purpose processing as opposed to being limited to a really fixed function processing, right? And this has enabled ideas like stream processing and pipeline parallelism. Basically, you stream data into a set of processing elements that are organized in some fashion. Each processing element has a small amount of memory. It still does maximum operations on the data you stream through it, but it uses its instruction memory and uh, data memory to actually uh, maximize its efficiency and program built. So adding instruction memory and data memory doesn't really change the fundamental principle. It really makes it more programmable so that you can store partial and temporary results. And hopefully this memory is small. It's con it's, it maybe even registers uh, to, to store constants, to store different types of weights so that you can choose between them. Adding instruction memory enables you to execute different types of instructions and become more general purpose, uh, basically. 
So there's a question. Why is memory not a bottleneck for when, for example, computing matrix multiplication, don't you still need to load a lot of individual data? Yes, absolutely. So memory is always a bottleneck and systolic arrays reduces that bottleneck, but you still need to provide the input data to the systolic array. No question about that, yes. And matrix multiplication may not be the best example also. Some, there, there are better fits uh, for systolic arrays uh, such that you really don't need to, uh, you, you really do more uh, with an individual data element, basically. In matrix multiplication, you actually don't do a whole lot with an individual data element. So that's a very good observation. Okay, so basically this, this idea of systolic arrays has actually led to a lot of bigger idea about more general purpose ideas like stream processing and pipeline parallelism, and more generally state execution as well. So what is state, uh, this, let me talk about pipeline parallelism very quickly. So this is one way of parallelizing your code. And in fact, parallelizing an inner loop, for example. So this is an inner loop. You have uh, A, B, C. Normally, you may not be able to parallelize it, uh, but because uh, you have some dependencies between uh, B and A and C and B, for example. So there's some data flow that goes from A to B and B to C, for example. Uh, and normally, if you execute in a single processor, that looks like this, clearly sequential. But you can split each iteration into three pipeline stages, A, B, C, and execute. Iteration I, for example, comprises of A, I, B, I, C, I. And instead of sequentially executing them on a single processor, you basically pipeline the iterations, uh, pipeline each piece of the iteration across different processors, P0, P1, P2. P0 executes A part of each iteration. P1 executes B part of each iteration. P2 executes C part of each iteration. And you may have nice connections between them. You may actually specialize P0 to do A very well, specialize P1 to do B very well, specialize P2 to do C very well. Or you may be a multi-core machine uh, such that you get have nice connections between the cores. You may be general purpose. Each stage essentially executes on one processing element. And you basically do A here, B here, C here. That way you can essentially parallelize this loop, uh, loop iteration uh, internally across different processing elements. So you get basically, uh, higher performance. Uh, you may not be able to parallelize different iterations of the loop because there may be loop carry dependencies, right? But this still gives you significant performance. And this is the idea of pipeline parallelism, basically, which is used in some parallel programming paradigms. And this fits very nicely to systolic computation as well, especially when A, B, and C are common computation patterns. And you can actually specialize your accelerator to do A, B, and C. And there are multiple other reasons to potentially do this. All of the A's may be operating on similar data, for example. They may have very good data locality so that you want to keep that data inside this processor. B's may be operating on similar data such that you want to keep data over there. You basically maximize the locality over here as well. Again, I'm not going to go into that aspect right now, but this is a programming paradigm that has been inspired by systolic computation and stream processing. And this is also fits nicely with the systolic array principles. If you're interested, you can actually read this paper that we had written uh, in ISCA 2010. But uh, I've already said this, but basically we divide the loop iterations into code segments called stages. And each loop has different parts, let's say three stages in this particular case. Threads execute stages on different cores. This is a general purpose programming model, but each core may be a processing element as you can see. And you can see that each core has a queue associated with it and they can communicate with each other through these queues, okay? I'm not gonna go through this uh, anymore. You can look at it, but essentially some programs can be written this way also. So this is file compression, for example, that is done in a streaming or pipeline parallel manner. And you can do all of this in software. You can all do all of this in, with hardware support as well. But basically you get an input file and you keep streaming through different parts of the input file and maybe different files as well. It depends on what you're doing basically. You first allocate buffers at stage one and then there's some a buffer you put, and then you read the input from there, and then you do the compression. You can actually have multiple stages for compression. Writing the output can also have multiple stages, and then you deallocate the buffers. Basically, you minimize the memory accesses by having specialized queues here, for example. If you, if you do this in software, of course, you go through memory, but if you do this in hardware in an accelerated fashion, the way we are talking about systolic arrays, uh, you don't need to go through memory each time uh, you do this. Basically, with each input element, you don't need to go through memory in any of these stages until you output it. Okay, so this is one example that you may want to think about. And this is the example of pipeline parallels. Okay, I'm going to, and these stages can be executed in different processing elements as we discussed that are specialized for different purposes. Okay, let me cover the disadvantage and advantage again, the systolic arrays. Basically we make multiple use of each data item, like in the previous example, hopefully. Uh, 
And this leads to a reduced need for fetching and refetching, better use of memory bandwidth, high concurrency as well at the same time, uh, and also a regular design, both data and control flow, which enables specialization. But of course, it's not good at exploiting irregular parallelism as we discussed. As a result, it's relatively special purpose. So you need software programmer support to be a much more general purpose model. And that's not easy to add, but more recently people are adding that support. And we will see that with Google TPU. But before we go into Google TPU, the first systolic arrays were actually implemented at Carnegie Mellon University where I used to teach, where H.T. Kung used to teach also. He did some of these seminal works on systolic arrays while he was there. Basically, they wanted to accelerate vision and robotics tasks at the, say, at the, at the time. They can read the papers that they have written. They had a linear array of 10 cells. Each cell was a 10 megaflop programmable processor. We will see the TPUs. That's going to be 90 teraflops today, but we're talking about 1980s over here. And this was an accelerator attached to a general purpose host machine, just like what a TPU is. And they had a high level language and optimizing compiler to program the systolic array. And I think TPUs actually have some of these and going to have some of these also increasingly. So the initial vision of the systolic array that looks like this is kind of, I don't want to call it reinvented, but uh, resurfacing right now with uh, tensor processing units, which act as systolic array-based accelerators for machine learning tasks. And you can see that this is a simple linear array. They call this the warp processing processor array at the time. And you, if you look at a single warp cell, it's not like the very simple systolic array that we have seen, but it has other things. For example, it has a very simple memory to, do, uh, to store constants, to store different weights, for example. As a result, it has an address generation unit. Uh, it has some simple registers, address registers. Multiply, you can see the multiply and accumulate units over here. And you can see they basically added simple memories here so that they can, uh, uh, local memories, so that they can actually do more general purpose tasks. But you can see that the input queues are X and Y, which are actually visible over here, X and Y. Uh, and there, some of them are bidirectional, as you can see. X, X is unidirectional over here, but Y is bidirectional, as you can see. Y is output over here. So basically, there's interesting design trade-offs that you need to uh, make in the design of a systolic array. And this is a very good example that I would recommend people to look at if they're interested. So let's go back to the modern systolic arrays. These are TPUs. Essentially, you can see a TPU does matrix multiplication. And it's designed to do matrix multiplication. And you can see that uh, in this paper, it's described in more detail. Basically, they have a systolic data flow into the matrix multiply unit. And they basically say software has the illusion that each 256 byte input is read at once, and they instantly update one location of each of 256 accumulator ramps. Basically, they actually uh, have, uh, I mean, it depends on how you program it, but you can actually accumulate the results inside the systolic array as well. But uh, you, you can see this paragraph from the Google TPU paper. Uh, figure four shows that data flows in from the left, and the weights are loaded from the top. Uh, I don't know if this is figure four, but. Yeah, this is a figure four. Weights are loaded from the top. They don't show it over here. But a given 256 element multiply accumulate operation moves through the matrix as a diag diagonal wave front. You can think about that. The weights are preloaded, as we have seen earlier, and take effect with the advancing wave alongside the first data of a new block. Control and data are pipelined to give the illusion that the 256 inputs are read at once, and, they, and that they instantly update one location of each of 256 accumulators. So they try to hide the complexity from the program as much as possible. As they say, from a correctness perspective, software is unaware of the systolic nature of the matrix unit, but for performance, it does worry about the latency of the unit. This means that if you really want to optimize for the performance, you need to know what's going on in the systolic hardware over here. Okay, so this is the example that you're going to do in your homework, which is essentially the same, except it may be a different way of actually implementing the matrix multiplication. OK, so if you look at the TPU, uh, this is the broader picture of the system. There's a matrix multiply unit over here, as you can see. And you can fetch the weights over here from the top and the input data over here. And the accumulators are over here. And basically, the data gets recirculated to the memory. So there's a lot of system level infrastructure that you actually need to build to make it work with a real software stack. And that's what I was talking about, basically. If you really want to make this work in a general purpose system, uh, the slide I showed you earlier, you really need to think about the software stack and the system controls to enable this. And that's what this Google paper is talking about that was written in 2017. OK, later, Google actually developed other TPUs, which are based on the same fundamental principle. But they basically figured out that you need more parallelism to do the training. So they have four TPU chips as opposed to one. 
They have high bandwidth memory so that they can do memory access much faster and much uh, higher bandwidth. They have floating point operations to do the training better uh, as opposed to some uh, proprietary format that they had. Now they can do 45 teraflops per chip. And this is designed for training and inference versus only inference in the prior TPU chip that I showed you over here. Now, actually, uh, they have released TPU3. They use this internally in their system, so they don't actually release it outside. But internally, they need to do a lot of training in their data centers. So that's why they found that it was important for them to design these accelerators. But if you look at a TPU3, which was more recently released, now the memory becomes bigger because they need to deal with larger and larger data sets, and they need higher bandwidth. So per chip, they have even higher high bandwidth memory. They have more matrix units per chip as opposed to two. Matrix units is essentially the systolic part. That's a systolic matrix multiplication unit. And as you can see, they can do 90 teraflops per chip as opposed to 45 teraops. Uh, uh, this should be teraflops, actually. Uh, we will correct that. It should be teraflops in TPU2 also. OK, so hopefully this motivates you to understand systolic arrays even more. Uh, and there's a reason why systolic arrays is used. If you read that paper, you will see that they basically suggest that this is much more efficient uh, than other types of computations they thought about or tried. Okay. There's another engine, as you know, that's built for machine learning, serverless wave scale engine. Uh, as far as we know, this doesn't necessarily use systolic arrays. It uses SIMD, which we're going to talk about in the next lecture. But I will show you this picture that I showed you earlier. You can see that it's a wafer scale. It's a full wafer, 1.2 tri trillion transistors. But they actually released a recent one. This has now 2.6 trillion transistors, and it's still 46,000 uh, millimeters square. It has 850,000 cores. I wanted to show you this one because this was released in 2019, and this was released in 2021. So they improved the process. And as a result, they were all able to get more than 2x times the transistors and more than 2x time, times the cores. And this is, again, showing the importance of uh, how much computation need and memory need is there for uh, machine learning going into the future. Uh, and we're going to talk about the basic principles, SIMD principles, uh, that this Rebus engine is probably built on uh, in the next uh, lecture.